Hello everyone, my name's Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today, we're going to cover chapter three for our MCAT organic chemistry playlist. And this chapter is titled Bonding. In this chapter, we're going to cover the following objectives. First, we're going to discuss atomic orbitals and quantum numbers. So we will describe the four quantum numbers. We're going to provide ranges of possible values for each quantum number. And then we're going to see how to visualize all of this. Then we're going to move into objective two, where we're going to talk about molecular orbitals. Here we're going to go over bonding and anti-bonding orbitals. And we'll discuss how the overlap of orbitals gives rise to sigma and pi bonds. Finally, we will talk about hybridization and touch on resonance just a little bit. Let's go ahead and get started with quantum numbers. Here I want to provide you with a little bit of context on where these quantum numbers come from. While you won't be tested on all of the background details, understanding this foundation will make it much easier to see why quantum numbers are so important. Since this is some extra context, I want to switch over to these pages here to help us out. We have to start with discussing the quantum mechanical model and quantum numbers. Now, unlike earlier models like Bohr's model, which depicted electrons orbiting the nucleus in fixed paths, the quantum mechanical model instead describes electrons as existing in orbitals, which are regions of space where there's a high probability of finding an electron. These orbitals aren't random. They come directly from the Schrodinger equation. And while we won't go into the math behind it, what's important to know is that solving Schrodinger's equation gives us orbitals and the rules that govern them. These rules are summarized by four quantum numbers, and each quantum number provides specific information about an electron's location and behavior. So let's go through the quantum numbers one by one. The first quantum number is the principal quantum number, and it's represented by the symbol lowercase n. It can take on any positive integer value, one, two, three, so on. This number tells us the main energy level or shell where an electron is located. A larger value of n corresponds to a larger shell, meaning the electron is on average farther from the nucleus. However, n does not only describe size, it also determines the maximum number of electrons that a shell can hold. When n equals one, the shell can hold up to two electrons. When n equals two, the shell can hold up to eight electrons. When n equals three, it can hold up to 18 electrons. And when n equals four, it can hold up to 32 electrons. These numbers, they may seem random at first, but we're gonna see exactly why this makes sense as we continue. The second quantum number is the angular momentum quantum number represented by the symbol L. This number determines the shape of the subshell within a given shell. And the values of L range from zero to N minus one. Each value corresponds to a different type of subshell. So when L is equal to zero, the subshell is an S subshell, which is spherical in shape. When L equals one, the subshell is the P subshell, which is dumbbell shaped. When L is equal to two, the subshell is the D subshell, which has clover leaf like shapes. And when L is equal to three, the subshell is the F subshell, which have very complex shapes. So the principal quantum number N tells us the shell and the angular momentum quantum number L tells us the subshells that exist within that shell. The third quantum number 
is the magnetic quantum number. This is represented by the symbol ML. The magnetic quantum number, it specifies the orientation of an orbital, and it also determines how many orbitals exist in a subshell. The rule for this is that ML can take on any value between negative L to positive L. For example, in a P subshell, where L is equal to one, the magnetic quantum number can have values of negative one, zero, and positive one. So there are three values of ML. This means there are three P orbitals in the P subshell, and they're labeled PX, PY, and PZ, because each of these orbitals is aligned along a different axis in space. The fourth and final quantum number is the spin quantum number, and it's represented by the symbol MS. This number describes the spin direction of the electron, and it has only two possible values, positive one half or negative one half. This means that each orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons, one electron having spin up and the other having spin down. Now that we understand the general rules for quantum numbers, let's begin to visualize all of the available orbitals that electrons can fill. Once we understand that, we can really begin to comprehend how electrons are organized in an atom. Let's start by looking at the first few shells. We'll begin with the first shell where n is equal to one. When n is equal to one, the angular momentum quantum number L can only be zero because the rule for L is any value between zero to n minus one. When L is equal to zero, this means that there's only one possible subshell, and that is going to be the 1s subshell. Then the magnetic quantum number ML, this is gonna be any value between negative L to positive L. Since L is just equal to zero, ML can only be equal to zero. We notice that there's only one value of ML. This tells us that we only have one orbital in this 1s subshell. Since each orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons with opposite spins, the total capacity of the first shell is two electrons. So our first orbital that we've defined based off of quantum numbers is the 1s orbital that can hold two electrons. Moving to the second shell here, n is equal to two. When n is equal to two, l can be equal to zero or l can be equal to one. When l is equal to zero, we have the 2s subshell, and when L is equal to one, we have the 2p subshell. Now the 2s subshell works just like the 1s subshell. It has a single spherical orbital that holds up to two electrons, and that's because ML is also just equal to zero. So we have our 2s orbital that can hold two electrons. However, the 2p subshell is going to be different. When L is equal to one, ML can take on any value between negative L to positive L. So it can have values of negative one, zero, and positive one. We notice we have three values of ML. This means that we have three orbitals in the 2p subshell. Each orbital can house two electrons with opposite spins. So together, these 2p orbitals can hold six electrons. And if we sum up both subshells, then the total capacity of the second shell is eight electrons. So here we have four more orbitals, the 2s orbital and then the three 
2p orbitals. When we move to the third shell, n equals 3. And now we have three possible subshells because l can be equal to 0, l can be equal to 1, and l can be equal to 2. When l is equal to 0, we have our 3s subshell. And here our ml value can only be 0, which means there's only one orbital in the 3s subshell that can hold two electrons with opposite spins. When L is equal to 1, we have our 3p subshell. ML values here can take on any number between negative L to positive L. So it can be negative 1, 0, or positive 1. We have three values of ML here, which means we have three orbitals in the 3p subshell. Then when L is equal to 2, we have our 3d subshell. Now our ML values, they can take on any number between negative L to positive L. So here our ML can be negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, or 2. This is five values of ML. This tells us that there are five orbitals in our 3D subshell. Each orbital can house two electrons with opposite spins. So now we have our 3S subshell that has one orbital that holds two electrons. Then we have our 3P subshell with three orbitals that can hold six electrons. And then we have our D subshell, which has five orbitals that can collectively hold up to 10 electrons. This means that the third shell can accommodate up to 18 electrons. Finally, in the fourth shell, where n is equal to 4, we add yet another subshell, the f subshell. And here it's going to hold 7 orbitals that can hold a total of 14 electrons. Let's work through this. When n is equal to 4, l can be equal to 0, l can be equal to 1, l can be equal to 2, and l can be equal to 3. When L is equal to zero, we have our 4S subshell, and ML can only be zero, which means there's only one orbital in our 4S subshell that can hold two electrons. When L is equal to one, we have our 4P subshell. ML values can take on negative one, zero, or positive one. That's three values of ML, so that means we have three orbitals in our 4P subshell. Each can accommodate two electrons. When L is equal to 2, we have our 4D subshell. Our ML values can be negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, or 2. There are 5 ML values, and that means there are 5 orbitals in our 4D subshell. Each can hold 2 electrons with opposite spins. Finally, when L is equal to 3, we have our 4F subshell. Here, our ML values can be any number between negative L to positive L. So ML can be negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. That's seven values of ML, which means our 4F subshell has seven orbitals. Each orbital can house two electrons with opposite spins. For our fourth shell here, we recognize that it can hold up to a maximum 32 electrons. From here, we can go back to our original notes and summarize. The principle quantum number n tells us the energy level or shell in which an electron is located. A higher value of n means a larger shell, and that essentially tells us that the electron is further from the nucleus. And when an electron is further from the nucleus, it's going to have increasing energy. It also determines the maximum number of electrons that can occupy a given shell. Then we have the angular momentum quantum number L. This defines the subshell 
within a given energy level, and it determines the shape of the orbital. The magnetic quantum number, ML, then specifies the orbital orientation within a given subshell. Finally, the spin quantum number, MS, describes the intrinsic spin of an electron, which can be either plus one half, spin up, or minus one half, spin down. And with that, we've covered everything we need to know for objective one. We're going to go ahead and end the video here. In the next video, we'll finish up this chapter. Please let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.